Experimental film flourished in the 1940s and 50s due to the increased availability of filming equipment and the rise of university production programs and film festivals, but it really started to become a fully mature art form in the 1960s. Experimental films of prior decades had avant-garde narratives and content, but usually at their basic level still had the form and structure of any other film. Things like Un Shen Andalou from Boonwell and Dali, or the works of Maya Darren were surreal and dreamlike, but still had a recognizable coherent imagery. In the 60s, filmmakers started to show an increased emphasis on form and structure. They experimented with full-blown abstraction and absurd tedium, and in many ways, took things as far as they could go. The emphasis on structure and form can most strikingly be seen in what might be the most important experimental movement of the era, structural film. These films completely abandoned any semblance of a narrative, and instead explored the fundamental nature of the medium itself. These artists wanted the audience to be fully aware that they were watching a film, often bringing attention to the physical material aspects of film itself. Their approach was analytical as opposed to the emotion-based works one could argue make up a lot of earlier experimental film. If any of the films were, that was simply an unintended consequence. Structural films could at times be hallucinogenic assaults in the senses, and at other times incredibly tedious. These may seem quite crude by today's standards, but I can't overstate how unprecedented they were in many ways at the time. I will give a warning that some of these films have strobing effects, so keep that in mind if that can affect you negatively. The most significant structural filmmaker is probably Canadian Michael Snow, and his most well-known work is Wavelength, shot on 16mm and released in 1967. Snow was interested in breaking down the fundamental aspects of film grammar, and here he analyzed the zoom. The film consists of a slow 45-minute zoom and basically no action. The zoom is not completely continuous, as there are edits and small adjustments to the camera angle. It ends by focusing on a picture of waves on the wall. There are people in wavelength, but the camera seems entirely indifferent to their presence, even when a man collapses and dies. Wavelength could easily be seen as related to the art movement of minimalism, but Snow rejected this connection. The film's title is represented literally in the soundtrack, which has a sine wave that goes from 50 cycles per second to 1200. Not even the slightest attempt is made in wavelength to provide entertainment as most people would conceive of it. Many experimental works from earlier eras are more accessible, like landmark films Unshen Andalou and Meshes of the Afternoon by Maya Darren. Those are much shorter and are much easier to appreciate on a surface level. But Snow's films certainly test your patience. And to fully understand its significance and massive influence, you have to place it in its historical context. Wavelength is often cited as one of the most important experimental films ever made, and it is certainly the most discussed structural film. Similarly to Wavelength and the Zoom, Snow deconstructed another form of camera movement in the pan, with the potentially headache-inducing 1969 film Back and Forth. Like Wavelength, there are mundane examples of people doing things, but these are not the focus. The pan starts out slow, but eventually goes at ludicrous speeds that turn the image into an amorphous blur. Snow is accomplished in many different forms of art, including sculpture, installation art, and being a jazz pianist. Another key structural director was American Hollis Frampton, who began making films in 1962 and was active until his death in 1984. His most interesting work of the decade to me is his silent short called Lemon from 1969. It is literally just a static shot of a lemon, with the only change being the movement of the light source. The lemon is slowly revealed and then cast back into shadow over seven minutes. Like with many structural films, the camera is locked off and does not move. Lemon also focuses on one single aspect of filmmaking. Whereas Wavelength looked at the zoom, Lemon analyzes lighting. Frampton's work also showcases the foregrounding of the physical qualities of film itself, like in his 1968 short Maxwell's Demon. It features a sound caused by perforations, also called sprocket holes, which are holes in the film stock on either side that are used by the projector to move the film. This emphasis on the material aspects of filmmaking was something new in the world of experimental cinema. Maxwell's Demon also incorporates strobing, something very common in structural films. Furthermore, Maxwell's Demon exemplifies another structural film trademark, that of repetition, as it contains segments of pure color periodically on screen. Its repetition, but with variation, as is common in the movement, as Frampton gradually adds ocean waves to the shots of pure color. 
Repetition with variation can be seen in many of Frampton's shorts from the 60s, like Artificial Light, Carrots and Peas, and States. Frampton further explored the physical qualities of film itself in 1969 with Palindrome, where he bypassed the camera itself and used the wasted ends of a roll of processed film. In Heterodyne, he uses something called a film leader, which is filmed as affixed to a reel to make projecting easier. Both repetition with variation and the foregrounding of the physical nature of film can be seen in the 1965 short from George Landau called Film in Which There Appear Sprocket Holes, Edge Lettering, Dirt Particles, Etc. As the title suggests, we see the sprocket holes, letters on the side of the film, and imperfections like scratches and dirt. It also contains repetition as it's a loop of a blinking woman. Like with Maxwell's demon, strobing can be seen in Tony Conrad's only film from this decade, The Flicker. The short is solely made up of frames that are completely black or white, resulting in the titular flicker that caused sickness in some audience members. One could argue that this is structural film at its most pure. Snow's wavelength had people and the barest hint of a plot, and Frampton's lemon at least had a piece of fruit as a reference point, but the flicker is just light in color. Conrad was also an accomplished musician and collaborated with members of groups like the Velvet Underground and Throbbing Gristle. Conrad's film has similarities to some of the work of director Paul Scharitz, most notably with his 1968 12-minute short, Touching. It also has intense strobing and frames entirely made up of one color, although mixed in with imagery that is discernible, albeit at times disturbing and pornographic. On top of that, the audio mind-numbingly repeats the word destroy the entire time. Charts did dabble in almost total abstraction as well, like with his dots 1 and 2, where white and black dots again create a flicker effect. An analysis of the material essence of film is also presented in the feature-length Tom Tom the Piper's Son from Ken Jacobs. Jacobs took a 1905 film and deconstructed it in various ways. The footage is sped up at times and slowed down at others. Jacobs zooms in, freezes the film, and brings our attention to things you'd probably never notice upon a normal viewing. The feature-length work is sometimes abstract or an unintelligible blur, and there's something vaguely haunting about it. Austrian Peter Kubelka made a 1960 film called Arnulf Rainer that was a direct precursor to the flicker. Visually, it is made up entirely of black and white frames and contains harsh white noise in the soundtrack. Watching these flicker films can be intense on a computer, but I can only imagine what the experience is like in a theater as was originally intended. The film is edited based on math and was divided into 16 sections of 576 frames each. It was then subdivided into shorter fragments of different lengths, and Kabelka compared this to musical notes and phrases. Like Kabelka, fellow Austrian Kurt Krenn produced structural films according to mathematical rules, but they also featured shocking and transgressive content. Other structural filmmakers of the 1960s include Ernie Gare, Malcolm Legrese, and Standish Lauder. As cited by film historians like David Bordwell, structural film was influenced by one of the most controversial figures in the art world, Andy Warhol. When I say that experimental filmmakers in the 60s basically took things as far as they can go, Warhol is a perfect example. A significant connection from him to structural film was a focus on the lack of or very minimal change. He also often used a static camera and repetition, both of which were structural hallmarks. Already well known for his iconic Campbell suit cans when he bought a Bolex 16mm camera in 1963, Warhol released the five and a half hour silent film simply titled Sleep that year. Like many of his cinematic works of this period, it's nothing more than what the title suggests, in this case just a person sleeping. Also from 1963, Eat and Kiss both follow the same theme. But his most infamous film in this mode was Empire from 1964. It's a monumental eight and a half hour long static shot of the Empire State Building. Early Warhol films are often talked about as an exploration of boredom, and they are certainly absurdly tedious. But it's also necessary to mention that Warhol did not intend for people to sit silently and pay attention to them from beginning to end. They were more like an installation in an art museum, and Warhol encouraged coming in at any time, talking, and doing other things during screenings. Warhol then moved towards at least something resembling a narrative as well as making films with sound. 
1964 Batman Dracula was an unlicensed adaptation of the DC Comics character combined with the horror icon. There seems to be no concrete proof of this, but a lot of people have speculated that this inspired the campy 1966 Batman TV show with Adam West. Warhol's film Chelsea Girls was the one that got him the most media attention. It broke ground by using two 16mm films projected side by side that showed completely different scenes, and the sound would be lowered and raised depending on what side was to be emphasized. At first, the order the reels were shown in was to be decided on by the projectionist, but over the years, the standard order has developed. Warhol was inspired to go into filmmaking by a man named Jonas Mekis, who helped with the filming of Empire. Mekis was a critic and filmmaker in his own right, and was very involved in promoting the underground cinema scene. His output in the 60s was very eclectic, and included a black and white feature called Guns of the Trees, which does have somewhat of a narrative, but is still very weird. It even has a poetry reading from Allen Ginsberg, the famed Beat Generation writer of Howl. Mekis also dabbled in the diary film genre by showing scenes of his life in Walden, named after the 1854 memoir by Henry David Thoreau. Mekis was an associate of an infamous figure in the world of underground film, Jack Smith, whose most notable work was Flaming Creatures. Smith's notorious 42-minute movie contained drag queens, nudity, and graphic sexual content, so unsurprisingly it could not pass the censorship rules of New York City. Mekis and Smith showed it anyway, leading them to being charged with breaking obscenity laws and the police seizing the film. Flaming Creatures also led to a falling out between the two, as Smith would later accuse Mekis of stealing the negative. Also crucial in the development of structural film is the Fluxus Movement, a group of artists from many different fields. Influenced by modernist icons like John Cage and Marcel Duchamp, they were instrumental in the early development of conceptual art, where ideas are more important than form and technical skills often unneeded. A key Fluxus film was Japanese artist Mieko Shiomi's Disappearing Music for Face. The 12 minute short is nothing more than an extreme close up on a person smiling at 2000 frames per second, which makes the movement so gradual that it's basically indiscernible. At first, if you didn't know what it was, you would just assume it was a static photograph. Like with structural film, the viewer is reminded of the fundamental qualities of film, in this case that it's just a series of still images. The mouth in the aforementioned short actually belonged to Yoko Ono, who is famous for her marriage to and collaboration with John Lennon, but was an established artist in her own right. Her early short films were similar to Disappearing Music for Face. Eye Blink from 1966 is a 35 second clip of Ono's eye blinking at 2000 FPS. Projected normally, this resulted in super slow motion. Similarly, her short titled Match took the same idea and applied it to a match being lit. She continued her filmmaking after meeting John Lennon, like in Two Virgins, which she co-directed with him. In the under 20 minute film, their faces are superimposed over each other and set to the experimental music from their album of the same name. Another Fluxus figure was Nam Joon Pike from Korea, who was indispensable in the creation of the medium known as video art. The field of video art has significant overlap with experimental film, and it's not clear where one ends and one begins. Pike originally studied music in Germany, and collaborated with legendary experimental composers John Cage and Karlheinz Stockhausen. His eight-minute short titled Zen for Film was just clear film that gained imperfections like scratches as it was projected over and over. The result is simply a blank screen, and Pike even had it projected on his body at some showings. The experimental cinema of earlier eras abandoned traditional narrative, but in the wake of the previously mentioned John Cage's silent 1952 composition 433, filmmakers like Pike made works that, for all intents and purposes, lack even any content whatsoever. Another of his shorts, Videotape Study No. 3, presents heavily distorted footage of President Lyndon Johnson in a way that resembles a malfunctioning television set. Pike often used television sets in his art, like with his 1963 work Exposition of Music Electronic Television that featured TVs manipulated with magnets. Loosely related to Fluxus was conceptual and performance artist Carolee Schneeman. In 1964, she made the ridiculous Meat Joy. She called it a celebration of flesh as material and gives us people in their underwear rubbing sausage, chicken, fish, and other things all over each other's bodies. Like Pike, she repurposed existing footage for her anti-Vietnam War collage film Viet Flakes, 
In this short, Schneeman combines images of atrocities the Vietnamese people suffered with all sorts of different music. She used small snippets of songs from pop artists like The Beatles and Question Mark and The Mysterians, Vietnamese music, and classical music in a way that resembles what we now think of as sampling. Also somewhat connected to structural film is director Stan Brakhage, who like Warhol made extreme films, but certainly in a much different way. Brakhage had already taken cinema into a world of complete abstraction in the 1950s, with works like Anticipation of the Night and Cat's Cradle that had a rapid editing style, lots of extreme close-ups, handheld camera, and disorienting jump cuts. However, he didn't start to receive significant recognition for his films until the 60s, when people like Jonas Mekas started to take notice. He made dozens of films in the 60s, but one of his most interesting is Mothlight from 1963, where he bypassed the camera entirely by taping moths directly to the film. Similarly, in his only 12 second long Eye Myth, Brackage painted directly onto the film. The physical manipulation of film itself is a clear connection to structural film. Brackage's major work of the decade was the cycle Dog Star Man, which consisted of five films. They were created separately, but since the cycle's completion in 1964, it has usually been shown altogether. It's often described as cosmic in a creation myth. It is in Brackage's usual style, but does have slightly more of a narrative than most of his work. Brackage's style was not only highly seminal for experimental cinema, as his editing techniques affected the mainstream, especially in music videos. Another filmmaker that started in previous decades continued working in the 1960s, and that's Kenneth Anger. He was sort of doing his own thing, and his films don't feel influenced by the major movements of the era like structural film. His main work of the 60s was the dialogue-free Scorpio Rising. Like his earlier work, it covers many topics that were especially controversial in this era, like the occult and homosexuality, and even has Nazi imagery. It also doesn't fit into a clear category when it comes to documentary or fiction, as Anger said that he was just filming what was happening. Scorpio Rising stars lots of leather-clad motorcycle enthusiasts, and is set to pop music like Elvis and Ray Charles. His later film, Invocation of My Demon Brother, was much more focused on the occult themes, and it features the famous Satanist Anton LaVey. Mick Jagger also appeared and created the abrasive soundtrack. Another important director of the 50s who continued to develop was Marie Mencken. She had a unique style, and her films feel a lot less pretentious than those of her contemporaries. Her work often used techniques like handheld and shaky camera or fast motion. She sometimes took years to complete a short film. Go, Go, Go is only 11 and a half minutes long, but it contains footage of New York City taken over the course of two years. Mencken often used very short bits of film, and you can see the connection to Stan Brakhage, who claimed her as an inspiration. She also made a documentary about Warhol and appeared in Chelsea Girls. Jonas Mekis also noted her influence, saying that she was one of the first filmmakers to improvise with a camera and edit while shooting, and that so many of us seized upon her movement and rhythm and developed it further in our own work. As we've seen, using and recontextualizing pre-existing footage, which had been around since the mid-30s with Rose Hobart, was a growing part of experimental film in this era. Another example is the work of Bruce Connor. His four-minute-long Cosmic Ray is a collage film that uses movie clips, commercials, and atomic bombs exploding, and is set to the Ray Charles song What Did I Say? Similarly, Gianfranco Barrichello and Alberto Griffi's La Fera Fica in Certa takes clips from various American films dubbed in Italian and edits them in bizarre ways that results in characters jumping from one spot to another or repeating an action. The viewer sees several different films all edited together, as well as squeezed from widescreen to a more square aspect ratio. Works like these are sort of analogous to the concept of a remix in music. Another important collage filmmaker was Canadian director Arthur Lipset. His most well-known work is the seven-minute Very Nice, Very Nice, which even got nominated for an Academy Award. The short is an interesting combination of photography and sound collage, where Lipset used leftover pieces of sound tape that had been excised during the editing of various projects. He then set the audio to photographs he mostly took himself. He made multiple more collage films in the 60s, including 2187 and Freefall. The 1960s were right in the heart of the Japanese New Wave, and there were several interesting experimental films from Japan in this period. One of the most significant figures in the art world to come out of Japan in the modern era is Yayoi Kusama, who specialized in installation and conceptual art. 
She suffered from mental illness that gave her hallucinations of endless fields of polka dots that she called infinity nets and inspired her art. In the 23 minute long Kusama's self-obliteration, where she's credited as writer, the dots show up on horses and nude humans. A director named Takahiko E. Mura produced several scandalous shorts in the 60s, including Onin and Love. Toshio Matsumoto made several documentaries and shorts in the 60s, but is most recognized for his feature from 1969, Funeral Parade of Roses. It was controversial for its gratuitous nudity and depiction of homosexuality, but also had metafictional elements with scenes that show the making of a film similar to the one we were watching. A filmmaker that put even more emphasis on metafiction was William Greaves in Symbiopsychotaxoplasm Take One, where peeking behind the curtain was not just an occasional interlude, but integrated fully into the entire film. It was filmed with three cameras, with at least one of them always on the crew. There's even a sequence where the crew films themselves criticizing Greaves. On top of that, the film experiments with split screen, sometimes showing both sides of a conversation or a behind the scenes view juxtaposed with the fictional world of the movie. Another landmark in experimental cinema from this era was La Jetée from Frenchman Chris Marker. The science fiction short is 28 minutes long and consists entirely of black and white still photos with narration. La Jetée stretches the definition of what film is as the only on-screen movement we see comes in the form of cuts from one image to another. Some might say this isn't cinema, but when you think about it, really all of film is just a series of still images. Finally, I'd like to touch on the experimental animation of the 1960s, especially from Eastern European artists. An interesting one is the light-hearted and whimsical short simply titled A from Polish cartoonist Jan Lenica. The silly and crude film tells the story of a poor writer that is inexplicably terrorized by a large animate letter A. Another Polish animator of the 1960s was Valerian Borowczyk. His short Renaissance uses stop motion in reverse to show objects putting themselves back together. Born in Czechoslovakia, surrealist Jan Svankmeyer gained recognition more for his features starting in the 80s and 90s, but made his first films in the 60s. Like his later work, his early shorts combined stop motion and live action. Like Svankmeyer, Yuri Trinka was also a Czech animator of this era, but instead of starting up, his career ended in 1965 with The Hand, his final film. It's an allegorical tale of control over artists represented by a giant hand. Director David Lynch's earliest stuff was made in the 60s, and he produced animated student shorts in the second half of the decade. While he was in film school, he made the fully animated Six Men Getting Sick Six Times, as well as The Alphabet, which combined animation and live action. The 1960s also saw some of the earliest computer-generated animation. One of the innovators of CGI animation was American John Whitney, who founded his own company after helping make the title sequence to Hitchcock's Vertigo in 1958. Whitney used an analog computer to make visual effects, and released a compilation of these effects as a 1961 short film called Catalog. The visually pleasing and colorful short inspired the famous Beyond the Infinite sequence from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Later in the decade, he made another trippy short called Permutations with a grant from IBM. Another major innovator in the field of computer-generated animation was Stan Vanderbeek. He often worked with the famous Bell Laboratories, a company responsible for an immense amount of technological developments, including lasers, transistors, the Unix operating system, and programming languages like C and C++. Vanderbeek created a series of CGI shorts called Poem Fields 1 to 8. They are trippy and colorful, and one even has music from John Cage. Vanderbeek was prolific in the 1960s and also worked in more traditional animation as well as live action. He experimented with all sorts of techniques, like cutout animation in the vein of Monty Python, and split screen showing four different images at once. He's also yet another that used pre-existing footage, often manipulated and distorted. He even filmed some performance art pieces with people like the previously mentioned Carolee Schneeman. Of course, many art house films have experimental qualities as well, but to do those justice would really require another video. However, I do want to at least mention a few that stand out as particularly innovative and notable. These include Ingmar Bergman's Persona, Jean-Luc Godard's Weekend, Sergei Parajanov's The Color of Pomegranates, Mikhail Kolodazov's I Am Cuba, Alain René's Last Year at Marienbad, and Alejandro Jodorowsky's Fondo Elise. In the 1960s, there were so many experimental films being made that this video would be way too long if I talked about them all. So I'll just briefly mention some more that are worth looking into, like Barbara Rubin, Robert Breer, 
Ron Rice, Shirley Clark, Gregory Markopoulos, Bruce Bailey, and Harry Everett Smith. That'll be it for this video. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to subscribe.